of the creators and directors of a blessing to one another, on behalf of all the people from around the world who have contributed things large and small to make this exhibit possible, on behalf of all the people here in Rome who have worked so hard in the difficult conditions and extreme heat to install this exhibit, <laughs> and on behalf of all the people who believe in the vision of St. John Paul II, that dialogue between the religions is critical to the future of the world, I welcome you. Karol Wojtyla as well could have retreated into a world of isolation. He could have never forgiven a God who had taken everyone he loved from him. He could have succumbed to the godlessness of communist Poland. He could have lived his Catholic faith without ever acknowledging Judaism as the elder brother. But he did not. He believed that the world could yet redeem itself. He believed that love and goodness could again triumph over evil. He believed that God would yet again have a plan for miracles in his life. That is why on May 18, 2005, we opened this exhibit on what had been the 85th birthday of the Holy Father. Seven months earlier, we had told him and Jerzy Kluber that one day we would tell their miraculous story to the world. The miracle of my friendship with Jerzy Kluber and his beloved wife, Irene, the opportunity to move through the halls of the Vatican and to touch the hand and to cherish the words of that Holy Father brought blessing into my life. A gentle hand had made these relationships possible. The importance of this exhibit rests not in the story of the past, but about its message for the future. We take the visitor on a journey through the past, but we do so ultimately in the hope that the journey will impact his or her future and the future of the communities in which they live. We want the exhibit to touch people personally and spiritually. Our hope is that this exhibit will inspire all who experience it to work for greater mutual understanding and for religious reconciliation in their communities. One of the traditional titles of the Pope is Pontifex Maximus, the greatest bridge builder. St. John Paul II certainly deserved that title. There can be then no better way for us to honor his legacy than to emulate his example. We too must be bridge builders. We must learn to take down the barriers that divide us from one another and build instead bridges of understanding and respect so that we can help to repair the world. Blessing in the end is the story of how we deal with the other. Whether the other is a religious other, a racial other, an ethnic other. We all have our others. Throughout Europe, during too much of its history, and even until today, the other for the Christian community has too often been the Jews. And it has too often been a terrible and frightening history. But that history can also be one History is written large and small. World War II, the Holocaust, the papacy of John Paul II are all large. But it is also written small in the human-to-human -human relationship exemplified by that of Karol Wojtyla, who would become Pope and Saint, and Yetzer Klug, a Jewish boy from Varvitsa who have a lifelong friendship with St. John Paul II. The history of Pope does not emerge because John Paul II as Pope had a sudden insight or revelation that he should change the relationship of the Catholic Church to the Jews, but because of a history that he had already lived during his childhood in Vadovica and his ongoing interpersonal relationship with people who happened to be Jews. In the Parliament of the World's Religions, we say, there will be no peace in the world until there is peace among the religions. 
and there will be no peace among the religions until there is dialogue among the religions. The exhibit, A Blessing to One Another, Pope John Paul II and the Jewish People, was inspired by Dr. Yafa Eliot, a Holocaust survivor and Professor Emerita from Brooklyn College in New York. While she was a visiting professor at Xavier University in 2003, she asked whether Dr. Buchanan and I thought that many people knew about this special, lifelong relationship between Karo Wojtyla and the Jewish community. We answered no. And Dr. Eliak replied, we are educators. Shouldn't we do something about that? That question became the inspiration for creating this exhibit. St. John Paul II, as a person and as a pope, welcomed the other, listened to the other, took their truths seriously, and understood that the only path forward for the church and the world was through open and honest engagement, which recognized the inherent dignity of the other. St. John Paul II's message and the message of the exhibit is that the responsibility of dialogue with the other falls upon each of us. But more importantly, it falls upon each of us to pass this message along to our children. One of the central messages of the exhibit is that what we teach our children, how we raise them, with whom we raise them, and how we teach them to deal with their others is of critical importance to their future. A Blessing to One Another is divided into four sections or chapters. The first chapter from 1920 to 1938 deals with the childhood of Karl Wojtyla and Vadovica Poland. Most people here at the Vatican and of course throughout the United States assume that the exhibit is the story about John Paul II's life. Of course it's the story of John Paul II's life. And John Paul II here, very important to us of course, he was born on the 18th of May in 1920. We opened the exhibit on what would have been his 85th birthday. I Unfortunately he died in, yeah. uh, in, in April of that year. But just a few months later, Jerzy Kluger was born also in Vadovice, Poland. And the exhibit here is a story of these two boys, the experiences that they shared both in their childhood and then after when they reunited. And for anybody who is a scholar of John Paul II or a, a lover of now Saint uh, John Paul II, what we hope people will see is that everything that was an experience in his childhood comes back again to be the experiences during his papacy. And very few people here in Rome, it's a little bit different, but very few people who've ever close seen... the relationship between... It's unbelievably close, you will see. But very few people who've ever... Of the million people who've life. seen this exhibit will become Pope. Maybe, because we're here at the Vatican, there's a chance. There is a chance. But everybody who's seen this exhibit can be Yeshua Kluger. Everybody could invite somebody else into their home. Everybody could be friends with somebody else. Everybody else, everybody could care what happens to their family and to be reunited and to build a friendship to change the world. And that's what we hope people will take away. So, come in. The goals of the exhibit are threefold, educational, commemorative, and inspirational. First, we wish to inform visitors of the special relationship that Karl Wojtyla had with the Jewish people from his childhood to the end of his pontificate. In particular, we highlight the special friendship of the future Pope and Yezhi Kluger because we believe that this relationship, together with the Holy Father's family upbringing, created in him a profound respect for the Jewish community that remained with him his entire life. 
Once you know the story of Carl's response to the Catholic woman who expressed displeasure that young Yeji Kluger, a Jew, had entered church during Mass, you are not surprised to learn what young Carl did once he became Pope. came and Wilhelm Kluger and uh, Jerzy Kluger left uh, to try to fight uh, again, uh, for the Polish uh, uh, army. Uh, they said to their three women, to uh, Anna Hupert, to uh, his wife Rosalia Kluger, and to the daughter uh, Stefania Artesha, you stay here, this will be safer for you. They of course were moving. So, but for Jews who come in, or for other Christians who want to know more about uh, the Catholic life of John Paul II, we have to introduce them to the, the sacraments, and here is Karol Wojtyla, his first communion picture. Again, Church of Our Lady, and then what coming into the Catholic Church meant for him, and a video of the inside of that church. It's a beautiful, beautiful church. One of the things that uh, Yezhir here just said that uh, he was not a very good student and he fooled around a lot and uh, Lolek, uh, Karol Vortiwa, was an excellent student and Yezhir's grandmother, Anna Hoopert, once said to him, imagine this, a Jewish grandmother says to her Jewish grandson, why can't you be a little bit more like Lolek? And Lolek became a pope. <laughs> So uh, after, uh, this is a ball made out of rags and rubber scraps, so after... The second chapter from 1939 to 1945 covers the war years, a time during which he witnessed the unspeakable suffering of the Jewish people and during which his vocation to ministry matured. Saint John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI are likely the last popes who will have had direct experience of the Shoah. The importance of the Shoah cannot be overemphasized as a critical factor in the Church's own process of rethinking its relationship with the Jews. The promulgation of Nostra Aetate or of Saint John Paul II's own historic first as a pope. If we are to rise to St. John Paul II's challenge that we Christians and Jews must be a blessing unto the world, but first we must be a blessing unto one another, we must put this relationship between the church and the Jewish people on solid foundations. And we must build on those foundations for a better future for relations between all of the religions of the world. Hello, I'm Carol Manley. I install the artifacts and I want to point out that this is a can of Zyklon B, which was the poisonous gas that was used to kill millions of people. And it was a pesticide originally. In the beginning of the exhibit, it chose a siphon, um, it, you know, that would have been used in the fields as a pesticide. But I want to note that the smell is still so strong, even 70 years later, that when you, after two months of this being on exhibit, and you lift this acrylic bonnet off, you are going to smell the same Zyklon B that is still remnants of it in the can and you have to wear a mask so when I take out the artifacts I still have to wear a mask 70 years later. The third chapter 1946 to 1978 describes Carlo Wojtyla's ministry in Krakow beginning with his ordination to the priesthood in November of 1946 and culminating with his election as Pope in October 1978. The story of the exhibit unfolds on two levels. On one level, it is the story of two boys, one Catholic, Karol Wojtyla, one Jewish, Jerzy Kluger, who become friends in a little town in Poland, and who, after the terror of World War II and being separated for 27 years, 
reunite in 1965 and reestablish strong bonds of friendship. But on another level, it is the story of two faith communities whose centuries-old relationship was difficult and strained at the best of times, and how this relationship began to be transformed through the initiative first of Pope John XXIII and Pope Paul VI, but then quite dramatically through the words and the symbolic deeds of Pope John Paul II. The final chapter, 1978 until his death in April of 2005, describes the dramatic steps he took toward the reconciliation of the Jewish and Catholic communities. Second, the exhibit intends to commemorate and honor the Holy Father for the giant steps he took toward reconciliation between the Catholic and the Jewish communities. First and foremost, his visit to the Great Synagogue of Rome in 1986. This was the first time a pope would enter the synagogue, and perhaps even more importantly, it was the occasion for the Holy Father to declare his oft-repeated acknowledgement of Jews as the elder brothers of Christians. Secondly, the establishment of the diplomatic relations between the Holy See and the State of Israel as a result of signing the fundamental agreement on December 30th, 1993. And then finally, the Pope's historic visit to Israel in March 2000, during which he engaged in two very important public remembrances. First, at Yad Vashem, where he called to mind the terrible tragedy of the Shoah, and then three days later, when he approached the Western Wall with slightly halting steps, and placed into one of the wall's crevices a prayer in which he gave voice to his memory of the blessing of Judaism to the nations, as well as memory of the suffering of the Jewish people at the hands of Christians and others. His prayer was, God of our fathers, you chose Abraham and his descendants to bring your name to the nations. We are deeply saddened by the behavior of those who in the course of history have caused these children of yours to suffer and asking your forgiveness, we wish to commit ourselves to genuine brotherhood with the people of the covenant. We live in interesting times right now. I think the challenges that face Pope Francis are profound. I think in many ways they're more complex than the ones that faced John Paul. And time will tell how the church deals with those complexities. Francis is going to have to work very hard in terms of creating not just the bonds that John Paul had, but building on that into a, a new and different future. And I think we all are waiting to see what that future will bring. We were permitted to have an audience with Pope John Paul II in October of 2004. At that audience, we told the Holy Father about our project, and we sought his blessing. We informed him that the exhibit would open on May 18, 2005, and that we intended it to be a present for his 85th birthday. Our hope is that a blessing to one another might play some small role in helping to foster relationships of solidarity between Christians and Jews and between all of the religions and in so doing help to realize a new and better future for ourselves but especially for our children. We are excited and pleased and honored beyond our ability to express it about being able to now bring this message and make our own contribution to this mission, mission here to the Vatican. We want to express our deep appreciation to all of those who have helped make this possible and our hope that its time here is transformative in small ways and large for all who experience it. Thank you. The American inventor Thomas Edison memorably remarked that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And so it is with a blessing to one another, Pope John Paul II and the Jewish people, whose run in Rome we conclude today. Yaffa Eliak's inspiration became the perspiration 
uh, Rabbi Ava Ingber, Professor William Madges, and Dr. James Buchanan, who, walked, who worked tirelessly on a tight time frame against odds which they could not foresee, thanks be to God, to get the exhibit ready for what would have been the pontiff's 85th birthday. The Board of Blessing to One Another is very pleased to announce this evening that we have made a gift of the exhibit to the St. John Paul II Center in Krakow, Poland for permanent exhibition. From that... From that conference room at Xavier University to the Vatican has been our journey with blessing. It now begins the next chapter of its journey in Krakow.